After the Apocalypse, a pandemic survival story. Season 2, Episode 11, John Tasker. The old man grabbed Brad's arm and hissed, Let me do the talking. Brad felt a strong grip on his arm and watched, mystified, as the old man transformed. He hunched over and assumed the guise and deportment of a completely different man than he was, an aged and feeble man. With the old man shuffling and supported on his arm, they emerged into the daylight. The motorcycles and riders were outside. Some of the bikes were still idling, and some had been turned off, the metal of the engines clicking as they cooled. Some of the riders dismounted. None of them seemed overly concerned with Brad and the old man. They were strangely casual, as if this were business as usual. Brad was terrified, yet surprised at the seeming lack of confrontation. The old man, not so much. In his brief glimpse of the men on the motorcycles, he had noticed something that Brad had not. That something was that some of them had jackets on, uh, looked like security guard jackets. The old man had weighed this quickly in his mind. These were uniforms of a sort. Uniforms pointed to organization. Organization typically wasn't in the playbook of random killers, and it certainly wasn't the M.O. of the king and his dogs. Sure, these people might be a gang of killers, but his gut told him they were something different. They could be one of those small tribes that now roam the wastelands of the apocalypse, killing and taking humans that had, through fear and loss, devolved into their feral state. A state that, if they were honest about it, was never that far away. The hard edge of civilization was broken and amorphous now. Not so black and white as it was before. Not as easily found. Not as easily held on to. People had been yanked forcefully from suckling at the mother teats of a stable society. And humanity, at least the civilized part of it, was a weak thing that was falling away like flaking rust. But these men had uniforms and hence still maintained some tenuous link to the old civilization. The old man bet his and Brad's life on that leap of faith. In his gut, Brad knew, despite his trust in the old man and the old man's bravado, that this was one of those moments where their lives hung in the balance. A group of eight men in their mismatched uniform jacket sat on or stood by their collection of motorcycles. Some were older and gray-bearded. Some were younger. A couple wore open-faced helmets. Brad tried to take a few deep breaths and clear the dark fog of fear from his mind. All the men had guns, mostly the sport rifle type, but Brad noted a mismatch of holstered pistols and a couple shotguns. To Brad, who'd been coached by the old man to observe even when he was scared, they looked like one of the pickup squads from his intramural flag football games at the community college, attempting to form a team from a mismatch of skills and equipment. One of the men, apparently the guy in charge, held up one hand in the universal stop signal and pointed an AR-15 with the other. Hold it there, fellas. Take it easy and keep your hands where we can see them. Are you the army? Brad blurted out, and the old man pinched him. The man in charge ignored Brad's question and said, Who are you, and why are you breaking into our facility? The old man spoke up. It seemed to Brad that, somehow, he'd injected even more gravel and aged into the tone of his voice as he spoke. Gentlemen! Excuse my nephew's manners. We are survivors, like you. We came here looking for medicine for my eyes. We didn't break in. Brad is an employee of this facility. Would you like to see his badge? Ha! No, that's okay. But we're going to need to take you back to the office to talk to the boss anyhow. So just relax. He looked past them at the door and asked, Is there anyone else in there? No, just us. The old man replied. 
the leader instructed two of the others. Ringo, you and Lance check inside. Be careful and don't go shooting a ghost again. He smiled, shouldered his rifle, and extracted a walkie-talkie from a mesh pocket. He spoke into it, nodding to the others as he did so. The rest of the men assumed at disinterested poses. They looked more bored than violent. There was no fanaticism or anger in their movements. They acted like they were doing a job. Like, at the end of their shift, they would punch out and go home. Brad and the old man would be someone else's problem. The old man remained silent, but was observing the group dynamics the whole time and was growing increasingly curious. Who were these guys? In a few minutes, a beat-up, windowless delivery van with a faded Port Authority logo on the side pulled up. They were checked for weapons, and their wrists were zip-tied behind their backs. But all this felt more like a routine than an imminent threat. If these guys wanted him dead, they wouldn't be going to the trouble. They loaded Brad and the old man into the back where the bench seat should be. Watch your head, Gramps, one of the men said as he helped the old man up into the van. The old man tried to count out the time that they were in the van and get some sense of the terrain they were covering. It wasn't much, but he needed to keep a sense of perspective. He felt the van slow and turn. They stopped, and there was the rattle of chains and the creak of a gate. Next came the slow acceleration and deceleration, an upward thrust of a couple good-sized speed bumps. The driver was being courteous. He wasn't trying to rattle his human cargo. After what felt like ten minutes, the van came to a halt. The doors opened, and they were pulled out into the parking lot. They found themselves in front of a low, brick office complex. Not new, maybe something from the Eisenhower era. Jersey barriers had been set up defensively along the front circle. The van had stopped near the entrance. The motorcycle escort rode by and kept moving around the building to a different destination. There were a couple other people in evidence, watching or guarding, some going about chores. The old man scanned the area. Looking up, he saw a low parapet of sandbags on the edge of the roof with a couple heads poking out to look down on their arrival. The thing that looked the most out of place were the half-dozen or so wooden structures with people sitting in them with handwritten signs over their heads at the edge of the parking lot. Brad squinted and elbowed the old man. What's that? The old man focused. He shook his head and said, Stocks, with a flatness of tone that did not match the churning of his mind. His mind circled around this picture. They may not be killing people, but they were punishing them, punishing them publicly to make a point. Public shaming throughout history had always been a powerful tool. It was an age-old tradition intended to motivate and make people conform with rules and norms of their communities. There was organization here for sure, but it seemed more than a little bit medieval. They were prodded towards the entrance, past an unoccupied security desk, to what appeared to have been a fitness center on the first floor. Brad tried to breathe and observe, but couldn't help feeling his world was getting smaller, his options narrowing, and his future dimming. Bill the dog yawned and stretched as the gloom of the distribution center deepened towards dusk. Bill belly crawled out from under the bench where he'd been lying. He stretched and scratched an itch behind his ear with his long back leg. The new men were gone. They'd done a walkthrough of the facility, but it had been easy enough to hide. They weren't looking for him. Bill's greatest asset was his discipline. He knew what to do when he had a job, and he did it with all the single-minded focus of a dedicated soldier. This was no happenstance or quirk of nature. It was a soldier who taught him, who groomed him, who raised him to be this resolute, committed, and disciplined soldier of an animal. The pandemic had removed that good but damaged soldier from Bill's life, but the training remained strong. When he ran across the old man that morning in the midst of the swamp, cooking rabbit on a low fire, he found a kindred spirit. They were both disciplined and damaged. They fit together. 
Now, Bill was a soldier in the old man's tribe. Bill nosed open a backpack and pulled out a mouthful of protein bars. He delicately peeled off the wrappers with a fastidious precision that was almost comical for a big dog. They weren't the best meal he'd ever had, but he knew he needed to stay fed and watered to be able to do his job well. He'd been told to stay, but he needed water. He moved silently to the door and waited for a long minute listening with his floppish ears, letting the air with its smells filter through his nose. No humans. No activity. Bill pushed and jimmied the door open and let his eyes adjust, taking another long moment to let the pictures form and the situation reveal itself like a great sensory Pollock painting. He smelled the pool of rainwater by the drain, the dirty, wet smell of parking lot runoff. He moved to the puddle and drank his fill. What to do now, soldier? Best to get back under cover and wait. He'd wait until waiting was the wrong choice. Then he'd go for help. A middle-aged, fit and muscular man with a navy tattoo on his left bicep and a towel around his shoulders sat on a weight bench as Brad and the old man were led into the fitness center. Brad walked with the old man on his arm, like an aging relative who was being led by an usher at a funeral to be seated. Apparently, this was the headquarters, and whoever they were, they greeted newcomers in the gym. And this was the boss. The old man leaned on Brad's arm and squinted. The wall behind the man had a U.S. flag and a picture of a president. Or, he thought grimly, probably ex-president. He wondered, what is this? A gang? A tribe? Some sort of religious cult? Plagues always brought out the religious nut jobs. Throughout history, when humans couldn't explain something or cope with something, they blamed an angry god. Would he and Brad become some sort of tribute or sacrifice? No way to know. Nothing to do but play the part and stay in the moment. Look for the advantage and wait for the opportunity. The first thing he noticed was the place was clean. Too clean for some random street gang. There was no dust on the equipment. Freshly laundered towels were neatly stacked on shelves. The trash cans were empty. This level of clean demonstrated organization and focus. What kind of organization cared about dust when 90% of the world's population had just blinked out in horrific deaths filled with blood and mucus. The second thing he noticed was that the lights were on. The mild glow of fluorescent bulbs filled the room. I apologize, gentlemen, the man on the bench said to them. Y'all caught me during my workout. He considered the metal dumbbell in his hand, placed it on the bench and stood up smiling. The bug showed we have to stay at our best, especially now, right? What is this place? Brad said, looking around the room. Who are you people, sir? He added with the last minute realization that politeness and respect was probably a good idea. The old man let Brad ask the question. He would learn from the man's response. Let people talk. Observe. Well, my friend, we are the government. The man paused officiously, watching how they took that news. The government of what? Brad asked innocently enough. I'll get to that. No need to get ahead of ourselves. Let's be mannerly and start with introductions, why don't we? I am John Tasker, the director of the Port Authority. This whole area is under my control. He smiled and looked at them, assessing. Now, who the hell are you, and why are y'all rooting around in one of my distribution buildings? Now the old man spoke up. Sir, we are refugees like everyone else, but we weren't looting. Bradley, my nephew here, worked at that facility and had permission. He turned his head to Brad. Brad, show him your keycard ID. Brad fished the ID from his wallet. The old man couldn't understand why Brad still carried a wallet. Habits die hard. The director examined the ID and spoke thoughtfully. Bradley Martell? 
Are you kin to the Bradley Martell who was chief controller for Automax here? That was my father, Brad confirmed. He died at the beginning. And here, Brad darkened, but continued looking at the floor. And my mom, I'm sorry to hear that, son. Brad was a damn good businessman and a good man. He would be pretty damn helpful now. The Lord took a lot of fine men. Tasker paused and considered. Well, boys, my thought is that Bradley here is one of us, and y'all didn't mean any real harm. And I'm going to be real nice and let y'all with a warning. We're free to go? the old man asked sounding much more surprised than he should have. John Tasker raised an amused eyebrow. Yes, y'all are free to go, he paused. Once you've completed a short probationary period. How short? It'll only be six months. The old man suppressed an urge to say something stupid, reset himself, and started again. Mr. Tasker, we truly appreciate your hospitality, but what if we want to leave before six months? Tasker took a deep breath. Well, the law says six months. As director, I am duty-bound by God and country to uphold the laws. My hands are tied. He spread his hands wide and smiled again as if he really wanted to help, but he had no choice in the matter. He continued, shaking his head almost as if he was talking to himself. Anything less than six months would be going against the law, and we just can't have that. Here in the valley, we do what is right and lawful. We can't have law-breaking. If I allow law-breaking, well, everything will go to hell. I ain't got any jails for law-breakers, so we just set them aside to think about what they'd done for a spell. Y'all probably saw that out front. If that doesn't fix your ills, we get a little harder. My justice system's pretty darn black and white. It ain't my favorite thing to do, but God has already done his part, and the only way to get back is to follow our laws. The old man thought to himself, This one likes the sound of his own voice, doesn't he? He looked at them, and some unreadable emotion passed across his face. Maybe the bug was God's will for the mess the country was in, and all for the better. Maybe it's like a fresh start. He waved his hand. You boys don't need to worry. I like y'all. Listen to this here boy Bobby. John Tasker conferred with an associate in a security guard jacket out of range of their hearing. He'll take care of you and get you settled. The old man had so many questions, but he knew he was being dismissed. As if reading his mind, Tasker continued, I know you got a lot of questions. We'll get to those. Get settled. Join me in the cafeteria tonight, and we'll chew it over. Tasker turned back to the weights, but stopped and addressed them with dark seriousness. I hope you two have the smarts to take advantage of this opportunity. Please don't make no trouble. It's just not in anyone's best interest. With that, John Tasker turned and picked the dumbbell up off the bench. He hefted it and blew out a lungful of air. Brad and the old man were ushered out of the room. The old man was thinking. His mind was worrying, but he could see no immediate reason to do anything rash. This was a time to watch and learn. The man, John Tasker, seemed to have the situation under control here. But something was off. There was a small whiff of something bad in this, like the first smell of the gangrenous leg. But wasn't there a mix of bad in everything now? He would wait and see. They would just have to wait and see. Hello and welcome back to the apocalypse, my survivor compatriots. How we doing? It occurs to me that many of you might be binge listening your way through the episodes, and you might be sick of hearing my voice at the end of the episode every half hour or so. 
I get it. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Right now, I'm binge listening through a history of the American Civil War. And it's always a bit funny, in an anachronistic way, to hear the host talking worriedly about something that happened two or three years ago. Or when they apologize for being late with an episode because of something happened to them. And you're like, hey, no, wasn't late for me. <laughs> it was the next one up. So anyhow, for you time travelers from the future, this is week three of January 2022. And I'd tell you about all these current world events, but by the time you're listening to this, you won't care. It'll all be in the past. Even events that seem awful and impactful to us will have faded to just another footnote in history when you get here. So tying this concept back to our story, I think even an apocalyptic event would eventually fade out. It would fade into the day-to-day -day cares of people, if any survived. You know, humans, we're, we're like cockroaches. If you don't get us all, you'll have your infestation back in no time at all. So this week, we introduced a new character, John Tasker, and he represents one of those centers of gravity in the storyline. Not so much him personally, but what he embodies, what he represents. Also, hopefully, <laughs> all you South, Southeast Tennesseans will forgive Robert's attempt at a Southeast Tennessee accent and my attempt at writing in a Southeast Tennessee vernacular. I know how much I cringe when I listen to an actor trying to do a Boston accent, so I feel your pain, but the show must go on. Uh, but now let's, let's talk about algorithms. Civilizations are built by algorithms. What do these people in these communities, these centers of gravity that we're discovering, what do they represent? The apocalypse is filled with all this struggle and tension, not just within the individuals for the salvation of their own soul, so to speak, but within the remaining and evolving communities that each contend to build or recover. Each is a unique vision of the future. How does one evolve and thrive and others don't how does that which how does which version of the of the future get chosen in the apocalypse and forgive me i'm going to go a little nerdy here because it's not just good and evil that's too simple it's the dynamic between different centers of gravity that will define the emerging or recovering modalities it's not chaos it's not chance there is a pattern to it, and it's an algorithm from a class of algorithms known as a genetic algorithm, and that algorithm is seeded or started with different assumptions and constraints for each situation, and then as the algorithm churns, each outcome is impacted by current events as it churns. So these algorithms are not random, even chaos settles into observable patterns over a long enough horizon. The emergence or re-emergence of civilization has a pattern. It evolves into being. And the three things that determine that evolution are first, the seed, which is what's the starting point. Second is the, the mutation rate. What changes, what events intercede that force the algorithm to adapt? And finally, most importantly, what is the goal? Or forgive me for using the technical term, the fitness criteria of the algorithm. The seed and the fitness criteria, they're determined by us. So the mutation rate is determined by the environment. So the combination of those things will create the output. Early evolutions or generations of this algorithm will produce deterministic and authoritarian communities because the fitness criteria at that point is simply to survive and stay fed. But later generations will evolve beyond that, hopefully, which gives us an opportunity to shut off our nerd speak with a quote from one of my fellow Massachusettians, John Quincy Adams, who said, I have to study politics and war so that my sons can study mathematics, commerce, and agriculture so that their sons can study poetry, painting, and music. So we've got 90 members in our Facebook group as of this morning. And in there, we're talking about good locations to base an apocalypse story. 
Joe said Puerto Rico, and I had this hilarious image pop into my mind of a Pirates of the Caribbean Jimmy Buffett zombie mashup. And we're running around 11,000, 11,500 downloads a month. Still haven't won the lottery or received a call from Hollywood, but (laughs) I will continue to push out a show every couple of weeks. I'm just about maxed out in terms of available time, and it it appears I'm going to be taking on a new role at work, and that's going to require a bandwidth adjustment. And to be honest with you, looking at the progress we're making on the Season 2 story arc, we may end up going over 20 episodes, but I'm sure that's okay with everybody. It's a new year, so do us a favor and go do that like and review thing so the algorithms are happy. We don't want the algorithms to turn malevolent on us. Links to the show and the Facebook group and all that stuff, all the links are in this, in the show notes. And by the way, for those of you who may be less podcast savvy, what that means is that there is text associated with the MP3 file that you are listening to right now. And there's an option somewhere in your app that you're listening to this on to show notes or display show notes something like that and if you do that you'll find these comments and uh, the links Uh, there's also a Patreon page that I've been meaning to update where you can give me some shekels to keep the lights on at Apocalypse Headquarters over here and this just in I told you that I converted the edited manuscript from season 1 into an Amazon Vela serial And I've been posting an episode, you know, the written version of the episode, each week. And I haven't been paying much attention to it. But I got an email from Amazon today that said I made money in December. So there you go. I'll put that link in there as as well. And you can check that out. And finally, we have our After the Apocalypse store on TeePublic that I spun up over the recent holidays. Where you can get yourself a sticker for your car that everyone in your neighborhood will be jealous of. And the links are all here for that stuff. Enjoy your week. Spring is coming. The days are getting longer, at least on my side of the planet, not for you guys on the other side of the planet. And most of all, keep surviving. Keep surviving.